Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. I know this talk is about microservices, but this room is anything but micro. I think it can see like almost 2,000 people. Uh, we are truly humbled by the interest in this talk. You are here for ARC 403, and today I'm joined by Kyle, who is a tech lead at Warner Brothers Turbine, and Will, who is a senior software engineer at Turbine. I am Dhruv Tokral. I'm a gaming solutions architect. But more importantly, I'm a friend of Will and Kyle. We have been working for such a long time, we are pretty much on each other's Christmas card list. So let me give you a quick summary of what you can expect for the next hour. Uh, I'll start. I'm the opening act. I'm the warm-up act. Um, I'll go over an overview of microservices for folks who are not familiar with the paradigm. Uh, we will then uh, follow up by, it's technically a part two of a two-part series, so we'll go over a quick overview of last year's talk, and that's followed up by a deep dive of Turbine's microservices platform. We'll go into details of their infrastructure, and then we have some real-life stories to share from launch. We also have a little bit of wisdom to share from our experiences. And then finally, since this is the night of the replay party, uh, we're going to have some beer after this. Hopefully, you guys can find us. If you have any questions that you want to ask us, you know, feel free to find us there. So let's get started on a quick overview of microservices. By definition, microservices are small autonomous services that work well together. Uh, a question that gets asked quite a bit is how small is small? And it's really an art as well as a science, but if you want to start out, start out by dividing your services across business boundaries. Autonomy means that any change or uh, upload to a service can be deployed independently, and that change should not result in a change in another service or any of its dependencies. So we always like to compare a new architectural paradigm with our good old friend, a monolithic architecture. Everyone likes to really talk about the big box that has everything, and the box goes offline, and your entire system goes offline. Um, but we've evolved from that. You know, we're leveraging the power of the cloud. You have a kind of a three-tier architecture that you see, and um, you know, we basically have your clients connecting to an ELB, and they distribute traffic over an app or a web tier. You have your database, and you have a database made highly available by adding a replica. Your assets and static files are put up on S3, and so this is a good starting point. You, know, you have your three-tier architecture. And then how would you scale this? Well, you know, you would start with an auto-scaling group. You would respond, you know, in capacity to, you respond by change in capacity to the number of incoming users. Um, you can add a caching layer to offload some of the uh, reads and writes um, on your database, depending on how you configure your cache. And then, you know, you can start, you know, using a CloudFront CDN on top of an S3 bucket to provide a global point of presence for all your assets. So, you know, this is... It, it looks pretty good, and it is not a monolithic architecture, but it can actually become a monolithic platform. And what does that mean? That means there's still some things that we can improve upon. So in this case, you, know, you have a platform that consists of, say, multiple calls. Let's say you have an Authenticate API, a Login API, a Friends API, a Leaderboard, maybe a Shopping Cart. Well, when you have to scale a tier, you have to scale the entire tier. Um, let's say you're launching your app, you're going to get tons and tons of traffic on, say, Authenticate and Login, but you have to scale the rest of the services with it as well. What happens if you're lucky enough to be the IT admin of the school? I'll let you guys read this for a second. So XKCD is a really good place to go to decompress, especially when your code's compiling or if you have answered a bunch of emails. But what I mean to say is you don't want to be in a position because in this case, your entire database tier goes offline, and most of your services will probably go offline. They might be live because you have a caching tier, but you don't want to be in this situation. And then how are your teams structured? Your teams are structured according to a tier. So you have your front-end developer. You know, this guy looks pretty happy because the CSS finally rendered. Um, you have your back-end developer. You know, she looks pretty happy. You know, she's on AWS. Uh, can't wait to use the agility. Uh, you have a database admin um, who probably just migrated to RDS. Um, these are stock photos, by the way. No wonder they look so happy. Um, it's just how Google works. 
Speaking of stock photos, this is your solutions architect. My job is the ability to paint really pretty icons and write text backwards on glass. That's the value I bring to the table. <laughs> Don't believe stock pictures. So what are the benefits of microservices? This is a quick list, and I'll go into a little bit of a detail, and then Kyle and Will will actually go into the implementation of all these benefits. But the first benefit is technology heterogeneity. You can choose the right technology solution for your service. So I talked about a friend service. Well, you can leverage a graph database, and you can use the graph database for just your friend service. Uh, if you have a real-time feed that benefits from speed, you can write that service in C, C++. Even when it comes to AWS, you can make fine-grained choices, such as an instance type. Uh, if you have a service that is very heavy on memory utiliza utilization, uh, you can use an R3 or an R4 instance. Uh, if you have uh, a service that is heavy on I.O., you can choose the appropriate EBS volume type. You can use a GP2 or an IO1 volume type. The next benefit is res resilience. Uh, if one component of a system fails, that failure does not cascade to other services. You can isolate the problem quickly, and the rest of the system can carry working on. So ex same example. If your Authenticate API falls apart, your existing users can still use the login API, so you're not losing all your traffic. Same thing with scaling. A, a large monolithic system basically involves a full deployment of the entire system. Um, that is high impact if something goes wrong, and hence a higher risk. Um, if you saw the keynote today, a few customers talked about how they went from like, a few deployments a week to hundreds of deployments a week. And so that benefits uh, from the market microservices paradigm. Same thing with ease of deployment. You know, a one-line change on, in a monolithic code base requires a full-on redeploy. Uh, in this particular case, uh, you, know, you can make a change to a single service and deploy it independently to the rest of the system. And one thing that is you know, kind of like a soft benefit, and you, know, you need to really think about this pretty hard, organizational alignment works differently in a microservices paradigm. So I talked about that slide about organizational alignment. When it comes to microservices, you basically align teams based on the service itself. So the service ownership relies with the entire team because they have been given the autonomy to make the technology decisions for their particular service. So how does this translate into a real-world implementation? I'm going to hand over the uh, deck to Kyle, and he can talk about the Turbine mobile gaming platform that is powered by microservices. Hi. I'm Kyle Borky, and I'm one of the tech leads on Turbine's mobile game platform team. And now that we've learned a little bit about microservices, let's talk about what we do specifically. So at a super high level, my team has two platforms. On the right up here, we've got our analytics event ingestion platform, which services multiple games, both console and mobile. And on the left, we have two examples of our game backend platform. So right now, um, we manage two games that have our full backend platform and nine that use our analytics event ingestion platform. And we do this with an eight-person team. So how did we get here? Well, we started with this old code base that kind of was passed from team to team and built up cruft over time. And by the time it got passed to us, it was this uh, distributed monolith that was really tightly coupled. Um, it was really expensive and hard to scale. And it was really, really challenging for us to deploy. So luckily, we had the opportunity to start fresh with our mobile platform. And we knew mobile was going to be big, so we really wanted to focus on scale and on price. And because we're a group of engineers, we really wanted to take a cutting edge approach, learn some new stuff, have some fun. <clears throat> so we had this Greenfield project, and we had this new team. And we had a goal to build a robust platform to support all of Turbine's future mobile games. But we built the team from engineers across the studio. So we all had different backgrounds. We had some people that loved Java. We had other people that despised it. Um, and even though microservices allow for a heterogeneous stack, we decided that we really wanted to focus on one language for the most part. And that's basically so that everybody on the team had the opportunity to work on any part of the platform. 
So we kind of coalesced around Golang, and we're liking it so far. So after we made that tech choice, we decided to focus on our culture and figure out how we wanted our team to work. So we knew we were building microservices, and that kind of led us down the path towards DevOps. Now, DevOps means different things to everybody you talk to. Um, so for us, it basically means that everybody on the team does everything. We all write service code. We all write infrastructure code. We all write stored procs. We all write automated tests. We manually test. And we run our infrastructure. And then, of course, after that, we did something stupid, and we volunteered to be on call. So if anybody here has ever done that, you know that immediately after you do, you think to yourself, oh no, what have I done? How am I going to stay happy in this environment? Well, first of all, you don't want to get woken up at 3 in the morning. That one's pretty obvious. But because we're in a microservices environment and we have lots of services, that means lots of deployments. So we want to make deployments really easy, and we want to be able to do them early and often. So we have to focus on our deployment tools early on. And also, because we're a DevOps team, we are already handling all of these different issues. And we don't want to be distracted. So we need to enable some self-service so that other people can get what they need without bothering us. Additionally, in microservice land, you want to make sure that your bugs, when you have them, hopefully you don't, but when you do have them, you want to, make, you want to contain them and make sure they don't ripple out across your platform. And then you need to understand how to scale, and you want to be able to do it cheaply, because that's one of our main goals, right? And then when something does go wrong, you want to make sure that you can fix it without SSHing into a box. You want to make your troubleshooting steps really easy. And because we're building a platform that needs to support multiple games, we really need a modular solution. So let's talk about our deployment process and how that helps us check off some of those boxes. This is what a standard EC2 instance looks like in our platform. Um, we run CoreOS with a separate cluster for etcd and console, which are both key value stores. Um, etcd is the data store that backs Fleet, which I'll talk about in a minute. And console stores our deployment configuration and service configuration, uh, as well as handles our internal DNS for service discovery. So on the actual instance itself, we have our console agent, which basically just maintains membership information for console. And then we have a custom tool called deploy agent. And deploy agent's job is basically to monitor console when it sees new deployment configuration, it, it will generate unit files from that configuration and pass those off to Fleet for scheduling. So Fleet is a scheduler. And it's a distributed init system built on top of etcd and systemd. And it basically uses systemd unit files with some extended syntax to give you a little bit more control over where in your platform uh, your units are starting up. And deploy agent basically gives Fleet a set of unit files. And those unit files specify their start order, as well as the fact that they have to start on the same machine. And we call that collection of unit files a pod. And all of our services are deployed as part of a pod. And for people familiar with Kubernetes, it's pretty similar to their pod concept. Each pod consists of a service container and then any number of reusable sidekick containers that might be necessary for the particular environment you're deploying into. So if I'm deploying a service into AWS, I might need an ALB sidekick so I can register my service with an application load balancer. But if I'm deploying that same service on my laptop, I probably don't need that because I don't have ALBs there. So in this example, Fleet is going to start up an EBS sidekick, which will reach out through the Amazon API find a particular EBS volume and mount it to the machine that it's running on. Once that's done, the service container will start up, and it'll have access to that EBS volume. And then an ALB sidekick will start, register that service so that it starts getting external traffic through the ALB. And then a DNS sidekick will start up and register that service in console for internal service discovery. 
So it'll start getting internal services uh, traffic as well. So you may have noticed that we had Docker logos all over that last diagram. We use Docker everywhere. Um, and the main reason for that is it lets us deploy everything in the same way. So we have lots of Go services. Um, we have some C Sharp services that other internal teams have written. We have a lot of third party uh, systems like Kafka and Zookeeper, and we deploy them all the same way in Docker containers. But that's not the only thing we get from containerization. Uh, you also have your code and your built-in dependencies all together in one binary. So it's really easy to deploy. You just take that binary, you drop it on an instance, and you start it. We also use from scratch containers where we can, um, which means they're pretty lightweight. Uh, most of our Go service containers are around a megabyte. So we have really quick deployments because there's not a whole lot of data that needs to get moved around. There's some security benefits as well. We drop all of our Linux kernel capabilities so that if somebody does get into a container, they can't really do too much. And then there's also the added benefit of it being relatively easy to run multiple services on a single instance because they're all wrapped up in a container. And this gives you some resource utilization benefits. So how does that work exactly? Well. We have a pool of R3 instances and a pool of C4 instances. And then each service is configured to have a preference towards RAM or CPU, depending on their needs. And Fleet will basically decide that it wants to put that service in a particular pool based on that configuration. But we don't actually care which specific instance it runs on. It can run anywhere. <clears throat> so we use ALBs for our edge services and things that need WebSockets. And then for services that are behind authentication, we have an ELB that routes traffic through our front door, uh, which we use Vulkan D for. We break auth there, and then that forwards to the appropriate service. Um, so in this example, we're running a feed service and a leaderboard service on the same instance. And if we want to scale up feed, uh, potentially, Fleet will decide that this, service is, this instance is pretty empty. So it's going to start a feed service container here. After that happens, it'll start the DNS sidekick, which will register it in console. And then it'll start the ALB sidekick, which will register its specific port in the ALB. Now, we use, di we use uh, Docker to dynamically generate our port assignments. So there's no conflict here between the first feed service and the new one. So once it's registered, they both start getting traffic, and everyone's happy. So in this way, we end up running a mix of 30 different service pods on a single instance in EC2. Um, and because we're using dynamic port mapping, it, there could be duplicate services on the same instance, which is awesome. So I mentioned earlier that we run everything in containers, and I was not kidding. Uh, we run Postgres in containers, and most people call us crazy, but uh, it works for us. We treat our databases as just another service. We deploy them the same way with the same pod paradigm. And of course, our Postgres containers are EBS backed, so um, they have a persistent storage to write to. We also use Wally to stream our wall logs to S3 which is really powerful because it allows us to set up asynchronous replicas with no production impact. Um, and that's also really nice because if somebody from analytics comes over to us and says, hey, we really need to look at your production data, we can just give them read-only access to our S3 bucket and a script to set up an asynchronous replica, and then they can run it on whatever hardware they want. And we don't have to care about it. We don't have to manage it. It's not our problem. So we talked about how deployments work, but how do they actually get triggered? It all starts with our chat bot. So we have a hip chat bot that we call Harbinger of Deploys. And it can deploy specific Git SHAs or tags uh, to any given environment. Um, it can undeploy services. It can roll them. It can scale them up and down. It can get environment health and do a bunch of really helpful stuff for us. 
<clears throat> but when it gets a command, it basically passes it off to our deploy service, uh, which is where all the magic happens. So our deploy service, when it gets a deployment command, it reaches out to our enterprise GitHub, pulls in deployment and service configuration, and that uses GitHub's OAuth. So if you don't have access to the configuration repo, then you can't deploy things and change production on us. After it does that, it figures out what containers are going to be deployed as part of this process, and it pulls them down from our container repository. Then it generates a deployment-specific encryption key and injects that into the containers and pushes them back up to our container repository. After that, it uses the encryption key to encrypt our service configuration and send it out to our game VPC's console. And if you remember, that's where deploy agent is sitting, waiting for new configuration to show up. When that config shows up, it launches the new service. And it's important to note that only the new images that have that encryption key can start up and decrypt their configuration. This is really important because it means that we know for a fact that our configuration hasn't been tampered with. So none of us uh, can go in there and hand omatic config to fix a production issue. We're just straight up disallowing it. So to recap, we have our deploy service, which lives in a centralized VPC, pulls its config from Git, generates encryption keys, injects them into the container, and encrypts the config, and writes it out to the console that's sitting in the game's specific VPC. Over there, we have deploy agent, which takes that config, deploys the service pod via fleet, and then it sits there and it maintains that service's scale and its health. So if one of those service containers dies, deploy agent will start it back up. So how are we doing? Well, we don't get woken up at 3 in the morning anymore because we have a self-healing ecosystem. We've made our deployments pretty easy, so we can deploy early and often with our HipChat bot. And we've enabled some self-service, so we don't get bugged by our analytics guys. Some of them are out here right now. Um, so let's talk about our platform and how that helps us check off the rest of the boxes. We really take an API-first design approach. And mainly, this is to help us avoid the classic microservices pitfall of creating a really painful, tangled web of calls. Um, if you get into a situation like that, it can be really challenging to debug problems, and it can be really challenging to deploy because you've got so many different dependencies. But we really start by defining our source of truth for a particular set of data. Once we've done that, we decide how micro we need to go. And this is really all about segregating your data and encapsulating the functionality that acts on that data together in one service. Most of our APIs are RESTful, uh, but even the ones that aren't, we have URLs that make sense and that are consistent. And we want to be consistent within our service, but also with, across our whole platform. And then this one's pretty obvious, but I think people miss it a lot. Um, and you really want to treat your service as just one implementation of your interface. Because at some point in the future, you're going to want to change things. And you're going to want to replace a service with something that implements the same API, but has completely different behavior. And then lastly, you really want to think about backwards compatibility when you're first designing an API. Um, in microservice land, you may have dozens of services that are dependent on this interface that you're designing. If you break backwards compatibility, it can be really painful. So spend some time thinking about it up front. If you need to add data to a response or a request at some point in the future, make sure you can do that without breaking, breaking your compatibility. So I mentioned segregated data. Why do we do that? Well, it gives us the ability to have per-service tuning. So we can use Postgres, or we can use Cassandra, or we can use a graph database, or we can use whatever we want. But we also can set specific volume types. We can figure out how many IOPS we need. We can say, oh, this service needs to auto-vacuum in this way, and this other one needs to auto-vacuum differently. 
But you also, when you have smaller databases, you just have smaller problems. So if you have 50 databases instead of one, each one of those is handling a lot less traffic, and it's just that much easier to handle. And then, of course, going back to what Dhruv was saying earlier, if one of your databases goes offline, it's not as big of a deal. So if our auth database goes offline, then no new players can log into our game. But everybody that's currently playing won't even notice. I think the biggest benefit here, though, is in maintenance. So if you're writing a database migration script that modifies a schema, that can be really complicated when you're in a, a system that has shared data. Um, if you've segregated your data, it's much easier to think about because you know that this change can only affect one service. And it really limits your testing scope as well. So you also want to plan ahead when you're building a platform like this. You really want to have configurable service discovery. We use console for that. Um, but there's lots of options out there. When you combine that with pluggable services, where you're basically coupling your service to dependent interfaces instead of dependent services, it makes it really easy to replace parts of your platform. And that's really helpful for us, because we can isolate our game logic from our, from our platform logic. And basically, for game A, we can run our game A logic service, and our platform can talk to that to get stuff done. And for game B, we can run our game B logic service, and our platform can talk to that. And that can basically change how our whole platform works. You also want to plan ahead, plan for failure. Um, in a microservices world, you're making a lot of internal calls. And some of them are going to 503. Some of them will 500. And in that case, you probably want to retry. But you don't want to DDoS yourself. It's not fun. Um, so make sure you're doing jittered retries with exponential backoff. Um, if you're not familiar with those, check out Amazon's blog. It's actually really awesome. Um, if you just Google jittered retries, it'll be your first hit. So we also write a lot of automated tests. And really, the key thing there is we want to ensure that our service is not breaking its API contact, con contract. We really don't want to break backwards compatibility. And we found that writing code that uses a lot of dependency injection can be really helpful, especially when you're writing unit tests. But you really you don't want just unit tests. You want to test at all the different levels. So you want to have unit tests for your logic, integration tests for any data interactions that you have, and then functional tests to confirm that your API is working. And the most important part there is you want to run those tests on build. So integrate it with your CI system. If you have tests that aren't being run regularly, then they're useless and they're probably broken. Additionally, to automate a test, you really need to load test things. So the key takeaway there is you want to estimate your load and your call profile, run your tests, and then collect metrics and soft launch. And then go back, re-estimate your load, re-figure out what your call profile is, because you were probably wrong. And then when you are load testing, don't just stop at a magic number that you got from marketing. Find your bottleneck. Push yourself. Push your service. Make sure you have a plan for how to fix that bottleneck, because it's much easier to think about that now than it is when everything's on fire. But low tests aren't really helpful unless you have metrics. So make sure you're collecting, at a minimum, call metrics. You, know, you need endpoint response times and throughput. You need database response times and throughput at a bare minimum. And you want to be able to set up alerts on those as well. And then you want to expose them as well as your logs in an easily searchable way. So that when you do get an alert, when you're out with your friends on your phone, you pick up your phone, you look at your alert, you click a link, it brings you right to your graphs, brings you right to your logs. And you can easily figure out, OK, now I know what's wrong. I can switch over to my chat application, type a few commands in, and then the problem's solved. And then when I go into work the next day, I can sit down and make sure that I never get that alert ever again, because who likes alerts? They suck. So how are we doing now? Well, we've minimized our bugs by segregating our data and writing lots of tests. Um, 
We understand how to scale because we've load tested everything. We don't need to SSH anywhere because we've exposed our metrics and our logs. And we've built a pretty modular solution so we can support multiple different games by having pluggable services with configurable service discovery. So now I'm going to pass it over to my teammate, Will, and he's going to talk a little bit about infrastructure. Hi, everybody. My name is Will. Uh, I'm a senior software engineer on the mobile game platform at Turbine. So we've talked about the platform service arch architecture. Uh, let's talk about what we run everything on. So I'm going to talk about the infrastructure that we've built. And we built this infrastructure with three big goals in mind. We wanted to limit the blast radius of any problems that we have. So we started with this because we know we're going to run multiple, multiple games, and we don't want one game that has a problem to affect other games. We also want the infrastructure to be immutable because we want to make it hard to have pets. We want the infrastructure as code so that the state of the infrastructure is well-defined, and we also have a very clear disaster recovery, disaster recovery plan. As Kyle showed you earlier, we've isolated things into individual game backends where they're isolated in VPCs with load balancers on the edge to get traffic in from clients. We're running those separately, and then we have a shared analytics event ingestion stack. If you want to know more about the analytics event ingestion stack, you can check out our presentation from last year where we went into detail about it. When we start thinking about how we want to limit the blast radius of any problems, we at the highest level separate everything out into accounts. So we have a shared services account with a shared services VPC. This VPC is where the deploy service lives, and it's the only VPC that has access to our corporate resources, like our enterprise GitHub, and has a VPN to our corporate network. This then, in a spoken hub model, can reach out into the game accounts that we run, where within an, we have an account per game, and within that account, we have VPCs for different environments of that game. These env VPC environments are linked back to the shared, shared services VPC over v VPC peering. Then for another game, we set up another account, same structure, VPCs for environments linked back to the shared services VPC. But these accounts and VPCs for the games have no way to communicate. They can only talk to the shared services uh, account. And within the account, the VPCs can't talk to each other. They can only talk back to the deploy service and the shared services VPC. When we start zooming into what we have in the environment of VPCs, we build these with CloudFormation, and then we start layering other stuff on top of that. We start with the auto-scaling group of the server nodes that we talked about earlier. We call them server nodes because they're the quorum-bearing nodes for our distributed key value stores at CD and console. Once we have those in place, we set up different auto-scaling groups of worker nodes that talk to at CD and console. So we set up auto-scaling groups for, in this case, we'll have a C4 node for compute-intensive processes. We'll set up an auto-scaling group of R3 nodes for memory-intensive processes. And those all then talk to the server nodes for their configuration and scheduling. Our original design had the worker nodes talking to the server nodes through an internal elastic load balancer. But as we've used CloudFormation over the last three years, we've really tried to simplify how we do everything and collapse the number of templates that we have. So we were able to really simplify this by switching out the load balancer for Route 53. Now we have server nodes, and we have worker nodes using the same template. But we start up the server nodes, and they pull in server cloud config, and the worker nodes pull in worker cloud config. For people who aren't familiar with cloud config, it's just an on-boot configuration process used to do a one-time configuration of a node, and it's all or nothing. If it doesn't work, the node is dead, and we have to go in and figure out why it didn't work. And then we don't change it after boot. Zooming out, this optimization also made it easy to unify how everything finds everything. The server nodes are using the root 53 record to find the other server nodes and set up the quorum systems. The worker nodes are using the root 53 record to find the server nodes to get configuration. And the deploy service is using root 53 to find the cluster to send the configuration to for deploying services. Our CloudFormation approach has really evolved over time, where we initially started with one large stack for an environment. But this was tricky to manage, because you could make a small change, like changing a security group. And that would ripple up and delete resources you never expected to delete. And of course, get into the worst thing ever, update rollback failed, which if anyone's seen that, they know how painful it is. <laughs> Although this is, not, this is probably not so much a problem now, because there are change sets which you can use to see the full extent of a change. But this is far before change sets existed. So we came up with a layered approach to where we build the dependencies for a VPC first as a one stack, so that it has the connection to the ops of VPC, the peer that we use. It has the subnets that we use for communication. It has the NAT nodes that we use to get out to the internet. Once that's in place and working, we take the outputs of that template and feed it up into the cluster-based template. 
Now, we used to have a bunch of Python scripts to manage this wiring of outputs to inputs for the templates, but just recently, CloudFormation added a feature to actually read outputs directly into the templates. So we've switched over to that, and it's a very nice feature. Once the cluster base is in place, that has all of the IAM policies, queue policies, security groups that we need to run clusters. We start building all of the other components, workers, load balancers, elastic cache clusters, as separate stacks on top of that, reading the outputs that have propagated up through the VPC base, through the cluster base, and then into the clusters. This is really nice because everything's isolated, and if we need to work on a single cluster, we have no chance of affecting other clusters. So we have everything in place. To recap, we've limited the scope. We don't, we've limited blast radius by using Amazon accounts and VPCs per environment. We've made things immutable by using CoreOS and Cloud Config. We have our infrastructure well-defined as code by using CloudFormation and Cloud Config. But it's immutable. How do we maintain it? How do we upgrade it over time? We use a feature of auto-scaling groups called lifecycle hooks. And what this is is you, you can subscribe to notifications from the auto-scaling group to do work on state changes in the auto-scaling group. In this case, when nodes come into pending, we get a notification that, hey, we want to add a node to the auto-scaling group. Should we continue and go ahead and do this? We, we look at that and then add the node to the cluster, and when it's safe, we move on. Similarly, we can get a notification that things are terminating, do the work to remove it from the cluster, and then tell the auto-scaling group to continue on and let it terminate. This is obviously really tedious, and we're lazy and not going to do it by hand, so we built an agent. This agent subscribes to the auto-scaling notifications and cloud formation notifications. It's parsing these notifications and hooks. And when it sees that nodes are out of date, it does the work to safely replace them in the infrastructure. And what I mean by out of date is that it sees there's a node in an auto-scaling group that has an old version of the launch configuration. When it sees that node with the old version of the launch configuration, it goes ahead and kills it. Then it uses the auto-scaling lifecycle states and hooks to go through and safely manage that transition. This is much easier to understand with a quick visualization. So what you're looking at here is a n equals 3 quorum-bearing set of nodes in a cluster. They're all communicating together in a distributed system. They're gray because they have an out-of-date launch configuration. The cluster agent has noticed this, and it goes in and terminates a node. Now the auto-scaling group sends a notification to the agent. It sees there's a node in terminate wait. It goes in and does the work to safely remove it from the cluster. Now the distributed system is in an n equals 2 but healthy state and it tells the auto-scaling group to continue removing the node. At the same time, the auto-scaling group has started bringing a node up into the pending state. We get the notification that there's a node in pending wait state. At the same time, the old node is done. It fully terminates and goes away. And we start doing the work to add this node back to the cluster to bring it up to an n equals 3 state. We tell the auto-scaling group to continue and move on. The agent will then go through and terminate all of the out-of-date nodes and then iteratively, we'll end up with a fully upgraded cluster just by changing the launch configuration on the auto-scaling group. So we have everything in place, but does any of this actually work? Let's talk about what we learned from launching uh, Batman Arkham Underworld, a mobile game we launched uh, on iOS back in July. So I'm going to show you some abstract graphs without absolute numbers. But the interesting thing here, coming from previously releasing console games, where people have disks ready to go, they've downloaded the game, they have the DRM unlock right at midnight. We were used to a launch where everything comes in right at the same time. You see the most traffic you ever see immediately and have to handle it. Whereas with mobile games, we had this more gradual launch. This is three days of traffic. This is the calls through each endpoint stacked up over time. And over a period of three days, we started to climb up the charts and then got to peak traffic over the weekend. But since we're using microservices, this traffic is distributed out over different services. And what is happening here is no one service is getting more than 20% of the traffic. And what that means is no one database is getting more than 20% of the traffic. When we look at the databases, we're seeing the, the DB throughput climb on the right. It's climbing up over time. But since we're well within our load test predictions, the response time is flat as traffic goes up. At the same time, we haven't stopped doing work. The deployment system is still doing its regular maintenance. Maintenance. The sort of background churn you're seeing here is old instances being TTL'd to clean up, make sure there's no memory leaks that we didn't find out. At the same time, we're also releasing new versions of code. Those are the spikes you see where deployments spike up for a while, releasing new versions. 
kind of cool for us. We thought it was interesting that over this weekend, we were doing more than 150,000 deployments per day with no player impact throughout the launch. So let's talk about what worked, some of the things that didn't work so well, and the lessons that we learned, and what we're going to move forward with. We're a small platform team that scaled a really large platform. Across our live environments, we have, well, last week we had 88 databases, 300 plus services, and 100 plus instances. It's probably more than 88 now that we've been at reInvent for the week. We're also running the analytics event ingestion platform for more than nine, ga for nine games. And the outcome was great as a platform team. Launch was mostly boring. We'd validated our expected distribution and soft launch. Everything worked within our load test predictions. We hit high scale overall, but we've distributed this out over various microservices, and no individual service handled more than 20% of the traffic. We had the deployment tools and the metrics in place to be able to easily scale with traffic. And it was also interesting that we saw this mobile scale up was much more gradual than a digital console game launch. So it took a few days, but we just scaled up gradually as the game climbed up the charts and got more popular. One of the things we learned from our last game is we really didn't want to have a war room. We didn't want people sitting in a room staring at all of the metrics all day and all night for days. We have alerts. We trusted our alerts. And we had an on-call rotation, but people were at home and not required to sit in a room and watch metrics all night. This was really successful. The other thing is we didn't show all of the metrics. We went through the metrics, and we were very careful with what we showed. We curated the visible metrics. We had like really useful high-level metrics for everyone to look at that were all over the place. The number of new players we had, the amount of money we were making. And we also had some fun metrics to keep people engaged. One of the cool things we had is we took our analytics data and made a pew pew map of PVP matches across the world so we could see a real-time map of players attacking other players across the globe. That was pretty cool. We also just had some fun stuff like players named Joker versus players named Batman to see whether the light or the dark side was winning. <laughs> These are definite hits. But at the same time, we still had all of the detailed metrics that we needed to make scaling decisions and to trigger our alerts, but they just weren't displayed everywhere. What didn't work? One of the big things we learned is that, oops, that's two clicks. Uh, one of the big things we learned is that under load, you have that local console agent and the etcd agent maintaining the nodes, the worker nodes in the cluster, but under load, they can stop responding to acts, and the members will flap out of the cluster. The problem here is when they flap out of the cluster, the schedulers say, oh, this service isn't healthy anymore. I better send it somewhere else. Of course, for our stateless services where we're running many copies for high availability, it's not a problem, no errors. But since we're running databases just as another service, if a database is on a node that flaps, it would get sent to another node, and the service would be unavailable while the database moved. This is unfortunate. <laughs> so we came up with a quick workaround. We just put a bunch of retries on and said, we're not going you know, to move a service until we've seen the node flap at least three or four times. This was pretty successful, but this is an active area of research. And one of the interesting things we've seen is that Surf, which powers console, has this new thing called LifeGuard, which is a more dynamic approach to handling acts under load. It looks like it'll be a really interesting approach. What we took away from this is that we didn't learn everything we could have from soft launch. We'd seen these weird reschedules in soft launch infrequently. But because it was very infrequent, it was very easy to write off as just, oh, it's the network being the network. Once we were under load live, it became much more common. But we had the logs and metrics to go in and rapidly root cause it and come up with that workaround that I mentioned. The lesson we're really taking away from this is don't ignore transient problems in pre-prod. They're only going to get worse at launch. And if you can't root cause it, you've got a real problem. The other thing we saw is in dev, partial, ha partial failure handling is not something that you see all the time, so it's easy to overlook it. But at load, someone somewhere is having an error, so you really need to think about it. The thing we're doing now is when something is broken in dev and people are having problems with errors, we don't fix it so fast. We figure out how to handle the errors before we fix the problem. And as we move forward, we're going to start implementing chaos monkeys and just generating errors so that we have to deal with problems in dev before we get live. Of course, the bane of anybody running a database at load is latency spikes. And we would load tested heavily, but we saw some anomalous behavior in prod. This was a pretty unique database. As Kyle mentioned, we were migrating uh, from our legacy systems to this new platform. And we had migrated one database that we couldn't split up into, migrate, data, into microservices as just a blob store that we moved to a new service 
um, on our new platform. So it had really unique performance characteristics. And it turned out the problem was we just hadn't disabled transparent huge pages. For people who aren't familiar with this, this is a Linux kernel feature which will go through and defragment memory for you to satisfy allocations. But if you have 64 gigs of RAM, that can stall your process for quite a while. So we saw this memory compaction happening fre frequently correlated with latency spikes, went through and disabled THP, and this reduced the compaction rate and reduced the latency spikes. We also had a more periodic latency spike where it turned out every time we took a backup, we were saturating the network interface. So we went through and throttled the backup rate. That was one of the deploys you could see. Uh, turned that throttling on, and that got rid of that periodic latency spike. So we're lazy. We have this cluster agent. It can go through and terminate nodes for us to get upgrades. Well, it got a little overzealous and deleted prod. <laughs> Uh, so what had happened is we had ignored the classic, if it hurts, do it often, and we hadn't been running the agent. We had this delayed prod upgrade. So we finally got to the point where we're like, oh yeah, we should turn on the agent and do this prod upgrade. But we'd accumulated some bugs and tech debt, and it ended up being two and a half hours of downtime, which really for deleting prod, not that bad. Uh, really simple bug where running is not equal to running. The mistake we've made is that EC2 running is not the same as auto-scaling group in service. Auto-scaling group in service means you've done the work to add it and it's safe to move forward. So the agent saw enough EC2 running nodes and thought it's cool to terminate stuff and went through and terminated everything. Well, now we have a quorum system, but it's fresh. Everything's been deleted. We've lost all of our configuration. We've lost all of our service discovery. We've lost all of our scheduling information. So good job, deleted prod, thank you. But we've planned for this. We have immutable, immutable config. We can redeploy everything from chat. This will be really easy. We'll just type a bunch of commands. We'll be back up in 15, 20, 30 minutes. But because we hadn't been doing it often, it took about two hours. Found bugs, had some external issues that were out of our control. But we learned a lot. So we have some new procedures out of this. First, we're going to make errors, deploy the Simeon army to shake out these kind of bugs early. And also, one other thing we ran into, we were running n equals three quorum nodes in prod. But of course, when you're doing the work, to maintenance work on one node in n equals three, it's inevitable that an EC2 node will fail a health check and get replaced automatically at the same time. And you're now down to one out of three nodes, and you've broken quorum, and you're in trouble. So in prod, we run four, five quorum nodes for safety. We had a lot of really interesting challenges along the way getting to this place. One of the things was we were migrating from this legacy system running on a NoSQL database. And we had split up a lot of the features of the old platform into microservices for the platform. But there was one service which was just a blob store that the game logic needed to be able to put stuff in there to make the game work. <clears throat> um, but this was incompatible with our current API design. And so we, we wrote a new service supporting equivalent features to the old service, but based on Postgres 9.5 with our current API design goals just using JSON B blobs and some metadata rows about those documents. But at this point, we're live in soft launch. We can't take the game down for weeks to do this full migration. So we built a shim to migrate from the old service to the new service, where what it was able to do is translate from the old API to the new API, and also lazily migrate data from the old service to the new service. This was pretty straightforward. We just did it in three phases, where we set up a pass-through phase, we put the shim in place, and it would just send requests through the shim. We then started validating the new service where we would send requests to both services, track any differences, and go through and fix whatever was causing those differences. Once there were no differences, we started doing a lazy migration from the old service to the new service. We would send requests to the new service. If it's working, if it's fine. If we see a player who was not in the new service database, the shim would copy their data over and then let it come from the new service. Once that had been running for a couple weeks, we'd copied over all of the active players and just did a bulk load to get the less active players over the new system and shut down the old service. This worked really well, and it was pretty cool to do this live without any downtime over the period of a few weeks. This is a really interesting lesson in running Postgres at scale. One of the things we learned is that large JSONB blobs plus MVCC leads to a lot of I.O. And from people, so MVCC is multi-version concurrency control. And what this means is you get row-level locking, but when you update a row, a new copy of the row is made, and when the old version is no longer needed, it gets vacuumed up. 
but because we had these large documents which contained things like locks and timestamps, they were being updated on almost every request. It's important to note that probably 90% of our requests are writes because they're touching these locks and timestamps. So every time we hit a row, we would make a new copy of a 50K row and getting a ton of I.O. But since we're in a relational database, we can pull out the frequently updated fields, put them in a regular row, and pull them out of the blob and leave the less frequently touched stuff in the blob. This worked really well and reduced our I.O. We also had a problem where we have these large documents, large tables, they're growing on disk really fast. In previous to Postgres 9.6, it, it grows tables on disk by a fixed amount. And every time it grows the table, it takes an exclusive lock on the table. Since we're growing tables all the time, this is a real problem. So what we had to do is partition the tables so that the table locks were on much smaller sections of the overall table that we're working with. This worked well. But in Postgres 9.6, they added a new feature where the growth on disk is dynamic based on the rate the table is growing at. So this is a cool feature that we're really excited about. Now at this point, the platform is stable. It's reasonably stable. So we're really focusing on how can we squeeze out all of the efficiency we can get out of the system. And we have a lot of data. We've been collecting metrics for ages. So we started with some questions. You know, how periodic is the resource usage? Is it just a simple daily pattern? Does it vary by day, by week, by month? And moreover, should we scale? Or is this something anomalous, and should we alert on it instead of scaling? Basically, how can we extract all the information we can out of the data that we have accumulated over time? So what I'm going to show you is a bunch of data that we've collected and kind of organized to start answering these questions. What you're seeing here is a month of CPU utilization for one game, one individual game. It starts on Sunday and goes through Saturday. And you can see the sort of Monday pattern is pretty similar, Tuesday pattern is pretty similar, Sunday through Tuesday are pretty similar looking, but Friday is unique. So Friday has this like very sharp increase and then rapid decrease in utilization. So if we just took a 24 hour, 24 hour average and used that as our model to scale, we'd underestimate how much to scale on Fridays and then scale down too slowly on the back end of the peak. When we look at CPU utilization for a different game, but just that game, it's very different. It has this bimodal behavior where US players and China players have peaks that are individual, and the ratio of those peaks change on different days. So the lesson that we're trying to embed into the model that we're building and validating at this point is that the day of week pattern appears to be consistent, but it's a, uni a unique pattern for each day of the week. So we have historical data for each day of the week, so we can look at the current rate of change and say, oh, this is Friday. How much will we scale on a Friday based on the historical data we have for scaling on Fridays? So I'm going to hand this back over to Kyle to talk about some of the conclusions we've drawn from all of this. So what have we learned? Well, we really like our microservices platform. Um, it's really allowed us to quickly add and change features and get them deployed rapidly into production for uh, both games. So we can also really easily swap out game logic from one to the other when we need to, which is really helpful as well. And it's been easy to scale so far. But this doesn't come without cost. Um, we spent a lot of upfront time investing in our deployment tools. And these days, there are other options out there with Amazon ECS and API Gateway and things like Kubernetes. You can probably save yourself a lot of time and money, um, but those weren't available back when we did this. So, um, But even with that said, you still need to spend a good amount of time planning out your APIs to avoid getting into, a, into trouble with a tangled web of calls. Um, so remember. If it hurts, do it often. Break things in dev all the time. Force your client teams and yourself to handle errors. Load test everything together. So we spent a lot of time load testing, but we only load tested our services one at a time. If we had load tested our platform as a whole, we would have found that flapping issue, and we would have fixed it before we went to production. So remember that you want to do both, right? You want to test your services, see how far they can go, and you want to test your platform as a whole. 
So what's next for us? Well, we're going to be writing more microservices. We're going to be deploying the predictive scaling algorithm that Will was talking about. We're going to add more chaos to our dev environments. We're going to be dropping packets. We're going to be returning invalid results. If you're expecting JSON, you might get a random stream of bytes back. We're going to force ourselves to be better about errors. And we're investigating Nomad as a replacement for our fleet scheduler. Um, and the reason there is that it'll allow us to remove etcd from our platform, which will simplify things even, for, even further. So hopefully we'll be back for another talk next year. Thank you for your time. <laughs>